Good afternoon. Welcome to our lecture program. I am Kostas Zanos, Vice President and Chair of the Program Committee of Hellenic Link Midwest. Before introducing our speaker, we always announce the two following lectures. In at the October lecture, I had announced that on Sunday, December 12th, Professor Alexander Skiru of Salem State University who talked to us on the origins, course, and impact of the relationship between Adamadios Corais and Thomas Jefferson on the Greek Revolution and American democracy. Regretfully, Professor Kiru was very recently diagnosed with a health problem that needs immediate attention, and our December lecture has been canceled. Most likely this lecture with Professor Kiru will be moved to April, 2022. On Sunday, January 16, 2022, Hellenic Lake Midwest will present Dr. Dimitris Keridis, Professor of International Relations at Pandion University in Athens, Greece, and member of the Greek parliament in a lecture titled how much Greece and Cyprus can count on the European Union, the United States, and the original allies in countering Turkish aggression. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Christos Yanakopoulos, who joins us from Athens, Greece. Dr. Yanakopoulos is research director at the National Observatory of Athens, Greece. His research focuses on modeling of climate change extremes and their impacts on energy demand, health, agriculture, tourism, forest fires, and other aspects of human life. He was a lead author of the United Nations Environmental Program Fourth Assessment Report for year 2007 on climate change impacts adaptation and vulnerability. His principal investigator in several major climate change related EU projects at the National Observatory of Athens, Greece, and participant in the World Climate Research Program. He is a member of the committee formed by the Bank of Greece in a study for the environmental, economic, and social consequences of climate change in Greece and has co-authored the report on the National Adaptation Strategy for Greece. He is the author of over 80 peer-reviewed papers and over 90 publications in conference proceedings. Today's lecture is supported by the Hellenic Foundation of Chicago. The support of the foundation is greatly appreciated. As always, we will close the lecture with a questions and answer session. You can type your question at any time, either during the lecture or after the lecture, by clicking on the QA box at the bottom of your screen. This will open another screen where you can type your questions. Those attending the event on Facebook can type their questions on the comments box on the left or at the bottom of their screen. Dr. Yanakopoulos, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Kostas. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this lecture to, to the audience of the Hellenic Link. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope you can see now. Uh, so, uh, as you said before, I'm going to talk about climate change, extreme events, and impacts for Greece in the near and more distant future. Um, I am a research director at the National Observatory of Athens. I have been working in the National Observatory of Athens in the past uh, 20 years, more or less, uh, having obtained uh, a PhD from the University of Cambridge in the UK in England and uh, a post an undergraduate degree and master's degree from the University of Athens physics department. Um, I, as I said, I work for the National Observatory of Athens. Uh, it is a research center in Greece. Uh, actually, it is the oldest research center. It was founded uh, 
uh, just uh, in the 1824, something like that. Uh, so it is more than, uh, it's nearly two centuries old. It, it is the oldest research center. And now it comprises of three institutes. Uh, it has the Institute of Environmental Research and Sustainable Development, uh, where I work. Uh, it, it, this institute deals with uh, uh, the atmospheric composition, the air pollution, climate, meteorology, uh, things like that. Uh, we have also the Geodynamics Institute, which, as you know very well, is interested in the earthquakes uh, and the seismic activity in, in Greece and in the Mediterranean. And uh, also we have uh, the Space Applications and Astronomy uh, Institute, which deals with uh, remote sensing and uh, astronomical issues as well. So this lecture is about uh, climate change and impacts for Greece. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit from globally, then we will go to the Mediterranean and then we will go to, towards Greece. So uh, as you know, uh, the, uh, we have seen a rise in the mean air temperature of the planet in the 20th century, uh, about uh, 0 0.75 degrees uh, rise per 100 years. This doesn't seem as a first like a big change, but even small changes in the Earth's temperature can have big effects and some effects are already seen to be happening. The warming in, of the Earth's climate have, has caused snow and ice to melt and also has caused oceans to, to rise. And it has changed the timing of certain plants, how they grow. A significant part of this warming has been attributed to changes in the atmospheric composition due to human activity. So this has prevailed to be called atmosphere anthropogenic climate change. And based on the mean value of a set of climate simulations, the average air temperature is expected to rise depending on the evolution of greenhouse gas concentrations by one to even 6.4 degrees in the uh, current century that we are on. Um, the IPCC is a, is a group of the United Nations that is dealing with an assessment of the climate. Uh, so the latest report came out in August uh, 2021, and uh, it says that climate change is rapid and wi widespread. Uh, so the, the report provides estimates of the climate is, that uh, is going above the 1.5 degrees global warming level. Uh, I will remind you that uh, in the recent Paris Agreement and also in the COP26, a conference of the parties that took place in Glasgow uh, and ended recently, uh, the focus is to keep the global temperature uh, well below two degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. And the, the big effort is to, to keep the global temperature uh, below 1.5 degrees. Uh, it is very difficult, uh, but we hope that uh, it can be achieved. Um, otherwise, we will have big consequences. Now you can see here a, a schematic diagram uh, just for the Mediterranean. You know that Greece is in the region of the Mediterranean. The problem in the Mediterranean is that it's considered a climate change hotspot. Why do we say that is a climate change hotspot? Because it is warming 20% faster than the global average. So. Uh, the projection uh, for 2040 is that uh, the temperature is going to rise by two degrees in the Mediterranean, whereas in global, uh, temp uh, in global levels, it is going to rise just 1.5 degrees. So it is rising much faster than the global average. Uh, consequently, we have increase also in seawater temperature, already 0 0.4 degrees. Uh, it, it can reach by 3.5 degrees by 2100. Uh, also, uh, we see a decrease in the acidity of the ocean. Uh, the warming, as I said, is 20% faster than the global average. So we have increased uh, forest fire risk. The consequences uh, also uh, 
the rainfall is also reduced uh, both in spring, also in summer, but also throughout the year. Uh, the consequences is that we have more heat waves, we have coastal erosion, we have more fires, we have invasive species that uh, are coming and uh, they were not part of the Mediterranean environment, like uh, uh, alien uh, fish that comes to the water in the, of the Mediterranean from the Red Sea. Uh, we have acidification of the sea, we have floods, and uh, we have also a, a big, a big consequences for agricultural production. Uh, water temperature is also expected to rise by between 1.8 to 3.5 by 2100 uh, with hot spots in Spain and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, here you can see a diagram with bars. Bars indicate different uh, model, modeling centers that do predictions. Uh, what is going, uh, how, how it has warmed uh, over the industrial area. And you can see that the recent years, all the recent years from 1930, 1950 especially, and as we go uh, to 21 to 2020, uh, we have um, uh, changes in the global mean temperature much above uh, uh, over the industrial area. So we have always positive difference uh, in the temperature. Uh, also, we have, uh, we have a double frequency of heavy and very heavy rainfall events in the last 30 years. Uh, so the increases in very heavy precipitation events are much more significant. If you compare, you, you see here with the light blue color, the 30 years, 60, 1961 to 1990, Whereas with dark blue color, you see the 30 year period 1991 to 2020. And you will see that precipitation uh, going from uh, heavy precipitation or very heavy precipitation or extreme precipitation, which is above 50 uh, millimeters of rain uh, has been increasing in the recent uh, 30 year period. So generally in the Mediterranean, and uh, uh, you can see here a schematic plot of Europe, and you see here the effects that we are projected for the Mediterranean region. So we see here for the Mediterranean, large increase in heat extremes, a decrease in precipitation and in river flow, an increasing risk of droughts, an increasing risk of biodiversity loss, increasing risk of forest fires, increased competition between different water users, Increasing water demand for agriculture, decreasing crop yields, increasing risks for livestock production, increasing mortality from heat waves, expansion of habitats from southern uh, disease vectors, decreasing potential for energy production, of course, increasing energy demand for cooling, uh, also decreasing summer tourism, but potential increase in other seasons, increasing multiple climatic hazards, and most economic sectors seem to be negatively affected. Uh, and also you get a high vulnerability to effects from, uh, of climate change from outside Europe coming into the Mediterranean. We now move to Greece to see what is going to happen, especially for the country of Greece. I think that uh, we all have a great interest in, the, in this part of the Mediterranean. Uh, as you know, the climate of Greece is typical Mediterranean. It has mild and rainy winters, but rel uh, relatively very warm or very warm and dry summers. Uh, generally, very big periods of sunshine throughout most of the year. Uh, Greece, being part of the Mediterranean basin, is also considered climate change hotspot with high risk for desertification. Uh, so climate change might have impacts in Greece, such as increases in heat waves, decreases in rainfalls, uh, increases in drought spells, increases in forest fire risks, and this can cause increasing environmental problems and risks over the coming decades and important challenges for Greece and the Greek territory. This can affect key sectors of the Greek economy, such as the agricultural sector, tourism sector, and also the, the population's health. 
Uh, climate change has already begun in Greece. It is expected to continue. Uh, even if global efforts to reduce emissions prove to be effective, the rise of global temperature will exceed 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade. And extreme weather phenomena and the risk of climate uh, events are expected to increase with adverse, adverse effects on the environment, ecosystems, economy, society, human health, and well being. Uh, the observed and ex expected rise in air temperature is accompanied in many regions by an upward trend in incidence of extreme weather events. While in Greece and in neighboring countries, it will be accompanied by an increase in heat waves, decrease in rainfall, and increase in forest fires risk. Uh, how we investigate these impacts for Greece? Uh, we participate uh, through our institute, uh, the Institute of Environmental Research and Sustainable Development of the National Observatory of Athens, is a key partner in many European and uh, national research pro projects. The most important projects that are currently running and target uh, the country of Greece, as well the, or the adaptation strategy to climate change of Greece, is a, is a life e EU project. This is a European project uh, called ADAPT in GR. Uh, it aims to boost the implementation of adaptation strategy and policies across Greece. As I said, this is a, an EU project, is funded by the European Union. And additionally, we have uh, an emblematic nationally funded research project called CLIMPACT, uh, which is funded by the Ministry of uh, Development. Uh, and the, our research in these two projects uh, focuses on climate change impacts, and we plan to enhance also decision making for adaptation planning uh, using future climate change scenarios as these are given by regional climate models. Uh, before going to the future, what, what the climate change is going to hold for us, uh, I'm going to show you uh, some information about uh, what has happened in the recent years from stations from the network of stations, meteorological stations that we have been operating across Greece. Uh, the Observatory of Athens operates a network of more than 400 automatic weather stations. Uh, they started in 2005 and the network is, st is still expanding. But additionally, we have uh, the, the most, uh, the, 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 the best weather station for the East Mediterranean in the center of Athens in the CO area, operated by the National Observatory of Athens, uh, starting to have observations since 1858. So uh, we have over 160 years of uh, observational records uh, for, for, for temperature in, in Athens. And this is a very big record because you can see uh, the temperature fluctuations, not just from a 30 year period that is typically uh, how many uh, most weather stations operate, but uh, 160 years uh, 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 temperature data. You can see here the, the annual mean temperature in Athens uh, for 160 years, starting from about 1858. And you can see it's very clear that five out of the warmest years of these 160 years long record occurred between 2010 to 2018. So in the recent period. Uh, also, if you look at the, the summer maximum temperature and the summer minimum temperatures, uh, also from this long record, you can see that there is a steady increase. Uh, for summer maximum temperature, we see an, an increase of 0 0.65 degrees per decade. That means every 10 years, the temperature increases by 0 0.65 degrees. And we have a, an even bigger decrease, uh, increase in the summer minimum temperature. That means the nighttime temperature, the temperature of the nights. That means the summer nights are becoming much warmer, also the summer days, but the summer nights are becoming even more warming. 
warmer. And the temperature of the summer nights is increasing by 0 0.82 degrees per 10, 10 years, per decade. A, a similar pattern you can see in other stations uh, around Greece. Uh, also, you can see here a, a recent a study that we did for stations uh, in the western part of Greece, for Agrinio, for Andravida, and for Araxos. And uh, you can see uh, here T maximum, how it has increased. Uh, you can see the trend uh, over the recent years. Uh, you can see uh, also the number of hot days, how these have increased. Uh, the number of days with T maximum uh, above 30 degrees centigrade. And you can see how this has increased over all the three stations. Uh, but you can see here that the increase is more substantial for Agrinio. That means in the urban areas and in areas that are uh, not close to the seaside, uh, you can see bigger increases in the temperatures uh, and also in the heat waves. This, the same is also happening in Athens. Also, you can see a decreasing trend in the uh, of total precipitation, also of the wet uh, of the wet days, both for all the stations. You can see the trend. Uh, you can see here the trend lines: uh, uh, blue, uh, orange, and green for the three stations in Western Greece: for Agrinio, for Andravida, and for Araxos. Uh, if you check again the long term temperature record uh, for Athens, uh, you can see I, I, I have put here some uh, highlights for the temperature uh, values of the 160 years of Athens. Uh, in 2007, we had the highest temperature ever recorded uh, in the observatory. That was 44.8 centigrade. Uh, this is the highest that we have recorded in the observatory, not in Greece, because in Greece we have recorded higher temperatures, uh, about 47 in Elefsina, I think. In Mediterranean, I think this year uh, they recorded in Sicily even 48 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, 2007 saw also the highest number of days with temperature above 40 degrees, we had eight days with temperatures exceeding 40 degrees. Uh, 2010 was the warmest year ever recorded in terms of mean annual temperature. In 2010, we had the earliest heat wave ever coming uh, in May. Uh, also in 2012, the warmest summer ever uh, is for both the maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures, it exceeded four degrees uh, the climatic mean value. Uh, also in 2012, we had the longest uninterrupted sequences of hot days, uh, 32 days above 37 degrees. Uh, and also five of the warmest years occurred during 2010 to 2018. And 2018 was the warmest year of the record as regards minimum temperature. And uh, let's go to see how we model now the future of the Earth's climate. Uh, to model the future of the Earth's climate, we need to take into account the interactions between the ocean, the atmosphere, the land, the cryosphere, and the biosphere. And this is done through climate models. Uh, the climate models, as you might know, or you may imagine, are computer programs that simulate the weather patterns over time and can estimate the Earth's average weather patterns, the climate, under different climatic conditions. So they, can, they are able to reproduce atmospheric and oceanic conditions. Uh, this is how a climate model is constructed. You can see that it's constructed uh, with pixels. So we divide uh, the Earth's or the surface is div divided, and equations are solved in each uh, area divided, uh, but also uh, on the top, uh, not just at the surface uh, of the atmosphere or, or, or at the surface, but also higher up in the atmosphere, or when you talk about sea, also at levels uh, below uh, the sea surface. And uh, to, to, to model the, the climate of the Earth, uh, of Greece, 
uh, we use regional climate models. We, we are not interested just what global climate models say because we want a finer representation. So we take the regional climate models. Uh, what normally we do, we take two future time periods. One is the, uh, very close to us now. Uh, when we talk about climate, we want to model 30 years at least, because this is a representation of the climate. When we talk about one year or two years, it's not enough to say this is a weather a climate event. So we take two, two future time periods. One is the 2031 to 2060. This is the near to us future time period. And uh, we also uh, have projections for a more distant future, uh, which is the end of the century that we live in, and is the 2071 to 2100. These two future periods, the near future period and the distant future period, uh, we compare with the control period, which is the 1971 to 2000. Uh, to examine the future climate change impacts, we use three IPCC representative uh, emission scenarios. Uh, because we don't know in the future how exactly the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions are going to evolve. That's why we have all these uh, meetings uh, with the directors and uh, of the states uh, that either convened in Paris some years ago or now in Glasgow, and they decide the future of the greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So we have three emission scenarios. One is a very uh, strict mitigation scenario. This assume that we are going to be reducing significantly the greenhouse gas emissions that we are emitting. The, we have the RCP 4.5, which is an in intermediately climate change mitigation scenario. This is called also a stabilization scenario. You can see this is a medium scenario, not very pessimistic, not very optimistic. RCP 2.6 is the most optimistic scenario, but we also have a business as usual scenario, which is the RCP 8.5 is a non-mitigation business as usual scenario with very high uh, greenhouse gas emissions. This assumes that the governments, the states do very little to control the greenhouse gas emi emission scenarios. And to, to study climate change uh, impacts in Greece, uh, we focus on three uh, vulnerable sectors which are very vital for Greece's economy, which have focused on agriculture, we have focused on tourism and for health. Uh, and we use meteorological variables, climate indices or combined indices that use a lot of uh, parameters in combination. For example, if you want to examine the comfort of a citizen, you don't need just to take into account uh, just the temperature, but the combination of temperature and humidity, because this accounts for comfort or discomfort. Also, if you want to take to examine forest fire risk, as you can imagine, you need to take into account the combination of meteorological variables, not just temperature, but also precipitation, humidity in the atmosphere. And of course, if you have high or low winds, it's very important. Let's go first to see what the future holds for agriculture. Agriculture is a vital sector to the Greek economy. And uh, of course, there is an increased water demand for irrigation, especially in the warm period of the year, because as you know, precipitation is scarce in Greece. And of course, be because uh, we have, uh, due to prolonged droughts that uh, is projected uh, by climate models, uh, we are going to have reduced water availability. This can also uh, affect soil fertility. We can have higher risk of uh, erosion associated with also with extreme rainfall and reduced yields from crops due to very high temperatures. Uh, in general, extreme precipitation can also affect the soil, reducing the organic matter 
which is a key parameter of fertile soils, increasing the risk of damaging the agricultural sector by reducing the annual yield. Uh, also, the degradation of agricultural lands can yield, uh, can lead to the phenomenon of desertification. Generally, for agriculture, climate change may create winners and losers depending on agricultural activity and location. So, for example, some locations in the north part of Greece may benefit a little bit from warmer temperatures, but uh, we need to adapt because adaptation can mitigate the adverse of effects of climate change under cost-effective terms. Uh, here I show you some plots of uh, what the future holds for the Greek territory under the three emission scenarios and what is happening currently in the reference period. The reference period plot you can see in the very left. And here I show you what is the maximum temperature uh, uh, for, for the territory. You can see here that uh, the, the plains of Greece and the areas that are the islands have higher uh, maximum temperatures. Uh, when you go to mountain regions, this uh, temperature is much lower. And in the plots uh, on the right, you can see the changes that are going to happen in the temperature uh, according to the three uh, scenarios. The, the, the very mild scenario, R RCP 2.6, the medium scenario, and the extreme scenario. You can see here that with the extreme scenario, uh, for the distant future, you might see uh, changes of uh, maximum temperature rising even uh, up to five degrees. Uh, so uh, as we go further into the future and as we change the mitigation, the greenhouse gas emission scenario, uh, we take more uh, extreme uh, impacts. Uh, if you see now the number of days with maximum temperature above 30 degrees, this is very important for cultivations because if you have very, very hot days and or if you increase this number of hot days, uh, then the crops might be very negatively affected in terms of uh, blossoming and in terms of uh, crop productivity and yield. And you can see here uh, that uh, under the three scenarios, you you have uh, you have increases in the number of days above thirty degrees, especially as you go to the high emission scenario, the RCP eight point five. Uh, of course, even with a mild scenario, you get a 20, 20 days increase in the number of days with temperatures above thirty degrees, uh, even. But if you go to the end of the century uh, and with a high emission scenario, you end up seeing 60 more days, 60 more hot days, meaning days with temperature above 30 degrees uh, than we currently have in Greece at the moment. Uh, and you see the areas that are highlighted in red or in red, very dark red color in Greece are the most vulnerable. Uh, if you see the total precipitation, uh, it, is, uh, it is worthwhile to see that uh, areas, uh, the control plot, uh, the left side plot, shows you the precipitation in Greece as it is in the current, uh, in the reference period. You can see, of course, you know that the western parts of Greece receives much, much more precipitation than the eastern parts of Greece. So the western part of Greece can receive more than 1,000 millimeters per year. The eastern part of Greece, especially where Athens, uh, Kiklades, uh, also eastern part of Peloponnese is located, they receive less than 500 millimeters per year. So it is uh, very big differences in the precipitation amounts. Uh, even one third or one fourth of what is received in the western part of Greece, uh, we receive in Athens or in uh, eastern parts of Greece as well. 
And this is projected to change in the near and distant future, especially uh, the, the for Peloponnese and for for, uh, for Crete, for, for areas in the south of Greece, the changes are going to be much more significant. Uh, if you go to the extreme uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario, uh, and at the end of the century, you might uh, see a 20 to 25% decrease of total precipitation amount. And accordingly, of course, precipitation is going to decrease, uh, but also the dry days, the, the consecutive dry days, the, the maximum length of consecutive dry days, of course, is going to increase. So we are going to have, uh, as we go in the future, in the distant future, uh, 2071 to 2100, and if we follow the extreme uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario, we might see increases uh, above uh, 20 more days of uh, droughts. Uh, let's go now to tourism and to health. Uh, climate also has been known to affect the tourist uh, preference uh, of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the tourists. Uh, of course, Greece, as you know, is one of the most known tourist destinations in the world especially during the summer period, because it has a very favorable uh, climatic conditions with warm and sunny weather, and climate change is expected to have significant effects on tourism activity. Uh, Greece's high tourism revenue makes the tourism sector a very important economic country resource, so the tourism industry should be very aware and be prepared for climate change. Uh, climate change can have impacts uh, also on the tourism industry. Uh, and what can change and can have impacts, we can have an increase in the number of days with high temperatures. Uh, this will impact on the physical comfort or distress of the general population and the tourists. Uh, we can have increased thermal stress with significant impacts on human health. Uh, changes in the climatic conditions of the tourist destination, especially by the end of the century. Also an increase in forest fires causing a decrease in the abundance of species and biodiversity of the natural landscape. So the landscape, if, if you get subject to many forest fires, might change significantly, so might not be uh, very, very, very good for somebody to visit uh, as well. Uh, we also have uh, extreme weather events and sea level rise and coastal er erosion can also affect the choice uh, of tourist destination and the tourism industry as well. Uh, here are some plots in the number of very hot days, the number of days that temperature is above 35 degrees, isn't very hot days now. Uh, you can see what is happening in the, in the reference period or again on the left plot and the changes in the near future, the plot above, the paid changes in the distant future, the plots below, under the three climate emission scenarios. Uh, you can see that in the near future, you can have up to 15 uh, more uh, very hot days under the business as usual scenario, especially in the central continental area of Greece. Whereas at the end of the century, you will have a plus 20 more days in the moderate scenario in the RCP 4.5, but even uh, up to 45 more days uh, as you go uh, at the end of the century with the extreme emission scenario. Another parameter that affects the comfort of the population is the very warm nights. Uh, because as you know, it's not just the high temperatures that we have during the day, but also if the temperature, if the high temperatures of the day are also accompanied by very warm temperatures during the night. This makes the nights very uncomfortable for people to sleep. 
So it is very worth to investigate also the number of days with minimum temperature above 20 degrees. You can see uh, what is happening in Greece currently uh, at the left plot and the changes that are going to happen uh, in the years to come, in the near future and in the distant future under the three emission scenarios. You see that all, all of Greece is going to be affected, even the islands is going to be affected by warm nights, what are called tropical nights, that the temperature doesn't fall below 20 degrees. Uh, so we are going to have uh, uh, 35 more days, uh, more nights, more tropical nights under the medium emission scenario, or even up to 70 more uh, warm nights if we go uh, to the extreme emission scenario by the end of the century, by 2071 to 2100. And if you see here the plots of the holiday climate index, this is an index showing the comfort of a, of a holiday uh, destination. You can see that it's slowly a little bit deteriorating as we go uh, in the summer and in the future with uh, the extreme a scenario. So we change from ideal weather conditions just to very good weather conditions. Um, and here are some plots uh, with a combined effects of temperature and humidity for, for the country of Greece. Again, the three emission scenario and, and what is happening uh, uh, currently in the left side plot. Humidex, this is an index that combines temperature and humidity and describes the physical dis distress or discomfort of an under, under average person under intense heat and high vapor pressure conditions. And you can see here how the distress is increasing, especially as we go to the end of the century. And if we follow the high emission scenario, uh, you get up to 20, 25 more uh, days uh, by, uh, by great discomfort. Uh, consecutively, uh, if you get increases in temperature, uh, of course, you are going to have increases in cooling demand. This is very important for uh, the energy companies uh, because uh, they will see an increase, a rise in the demand for cooling uh, for a very a very, a very short period, either of the day or of the year. So they see a peak in demand in the summer months, but also peaks during the day is when the days are very, when, when it is very, very hot. So sometimes they cannot meet this demand. So sometimes the, uh, the areas, some areas might be subject to have some blackouts if uh, you get a uh, very high energy demands. So the demand for cooling is going to, to increase quite a lot in the future. Uh, so uh, you, you can see by the end of the century, in the distant future, you might see uh, up to 40 uh, or even up to 60 more days if you follow the the extreme mitigation scenario, the scenario with the high greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you will have high cooling demands. The advantage of all this, of climate change, is that you are going to see a, a, a drop in the heating demand that you have in winter. So uh, uh, the, the days that you needed to cool, to heat your house in winter is going to drop in the future, especially by 2071 to 2100. However, this drop is not going to counteract the rise that you are going to have in the, uh, uh, the rise that you have in the cooling demands in the summer. Now, now I will take you to see uh, what the future holds in Greece for the risk of fire. Of course, you have heard that we had uh, uh, very big fires recently. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we had fires that uh, also result in loss of human lives. Uh, and in order to model uh, forest fire risk, uh, we use an index 
uh, that was developed initially for Canada, but uh, they have shown the experiments in Portugal uh, and other regions in the Mediterranean has shown that is suitable to be used in the Mediterranean. And now the European Union is using this index, it's called the Fire Weather Index. Uh, and it takes into account uh, not just temperature, it takes into account precipitation, uh, wind speed, um, uh, wind speed, which is also very important, precipitation and humidity. Um, so since 19, uh, 2007, this index has been adopted by the EU level, by the European Forest Fire Information System of the Copernicus Emergency Management Service to assess fire danger in a harmonized uh, way through, throughout Europe. This is where you can find this information. And it has several classifications. Uh, keep in mind what, that when uh, this index takes values above 30, you start to have high fire risk uh, in your area. Uh, if it goes above 40, you have very high, uh, very high fire risk. And if it goes above 50, you have extreme fire, uh, fire risk. Uh, and see, this is uh, the number of days in Greece uh, with a high fire risk uh, with FWI above 30. Uh, this is what is happening in the present, in the reference period uh, in the left side plot, you can see the areas that are mostly affected by forest fires is mostly the eastern part of Greece, uh, all the eastern part, also the islands, the south part of Greece, uh, Crete as well. Uh, these are the parts of Greece most affected by forest fires, by fire, fire risk. And you can see the difference that we are going to face, how many more days we are going to have uh, in the in the near future and in the distant future under the three climate scenarios. Uh, it is worth to see that even if we follow the extreme uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario, even in the, in the near future, we are going to see uh, 20 more days of high fire risk. And uh, by the end of the century, we are going to see 40 or even more than 40 uh, add, uh, to add uh, 40 more days in the distant future uh, with high fire risk. Uh, how can somebody take now information, all this information that I showed you, uh, sometimes most of this information now exists in several portals. Uh, we have constructed uh, some web portals. Uh, one is for the whole of Greece, it is a portal that has been constructed in the Ministry of the Environment in the project uh, that we are participating. The links that you can see this and uh, download the maps that you are interested uh, are located there in the links there. It's adaptivegreece.gr. Uh, but we have also created much more specialized tools uh, th throughout other projects uh, so one is the adapt to climate tool. Uh, th this has targeted the agriculture area specifically. And you can find the tool. Uh, this has taken place uh, specifically for the island of Crete. So you can find the tool and information for Crete and the impact on the crops of Crete uh, in the tool there. Uh, but also you can find also another tool that we have created specifically for urban areas because they, they need special attention. Uh, 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 we, uh, throughout the project that, that was called Urban Proof. And uh, now I will take you to the strategy that we have in Greece uh, for adaptation. Uh, when, when we say adaptation, uh, we mean the policies that are in place to moderate the impacts of climate change. These are referred as adaptation policies, and they consist of taking appropriate actions to address the expected damage and adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, and we have the EU adaptation strategy going down as a top-down approach to the national adaptation strategy. That means the adaptation strategy of the country. 
And then we go to a regional and more local uh, adaptation plans. Some words about the European adaptation strategy. The European Commission has adopted its new EU adaptation strategy to climate change uh, in 2021, in February. This new strategy set out how the European Union can adapt to the unavoidable impacts of climate change and how they can become climate resilient by 2050. The strategy has four principal objectives to make adaptation smarter, swifter and more systemic and to, to step up international action, action on adaptation to climate change. Smarter adaptation means improving knowledge and manage uncertainty more systemic adaptation is supporting policy development at all levels and at all policy fields, including three cost cutting priorities to integrate adaptation. And faster adaptation, we need to speed up adaptation implementation across the board, across all the countries of Europe. Um, a country has, now we go to the country level, to the national level. The country has to include future climate change on possible outcomes and mitigate its impact. So adaptation policies, policies should target the sectors of activities that are more vulnerable to climate change. So now that I showed you the impacts on agriculture, on tourism, on forest fires, on energy demand, uh, adaptation strategies should target all the sectors that we saw uh, previously in the diagrams that I showed you that have adverse effects uh, from climate change. And so the Ministry of the Environment and Energy, together with the Bank of Greece and the Academy of Athens, uh, have created the National Ad Adaptation Strategy. Uh, and they have created a Climate Change Impact Study Committee. This was formed by the Bank of Greece. Uh, I, am, uh, I am a member of this Climate Change Impact Study Committee. Uh, so uh, the, the overarching objective of Greece's adaptation strategy is to strengthen the country's resilience to the impacts of climate change and to create conditions for well-informed and far-sighted decisions that address risks and opportunities resulting from a changing climate. This national adaptation strategy provides an initial five-year horizon for building the capacity for adaptation and for prioritizing and implementing an initial set of actions. Now, going from the national adaptation strategy, we have also the regional adaptation strategies, the strategies of the 13 region of regional authorities of Greece. When we say regional authorities, you know, we mean Attica, we mean Thessaly, we mean uh, Macedonia, we mean Epirus, Peloponnese. These are examples of the regional authorities. So they, they implement their own regional adaptation plans and they set the minimum uh, requirements uh, for adaptation. Uh, so uh, the regional adaptation plans, they examine the potential measures and actions that included in the national strategies and they will reveal, we, we, uh, we'll see their particular circumstances, regional circumstances, priority and needs. So in, uh, they will develop their own regional action plans. And then after the regions, we have also the local initiatives, which we mean the, the municipality initio initiatives. Uh, the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the goals and directions which are defined with these cities through a consultation process uh, is more ambitious and broad range and a signatory how cities can pledge to actively support the implementation of the EU 40% reduction to greenhouse gas targets by 2030 and agreed to adopt an integrated approach to climate change mitigation and adaptation and to ensure access to secure, sustainable and affordable energy for all. Uh, this is uh, the Covenant of Mayors uh, initiative. Uh, and in the Covenant of Mayors, which is uh, an EU initiative, uh, 180 Greek cities uh, are participating in this uh, initiative. Some examples of uh, adaptation options uh, for different
uh, in order to understand uh, 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 what are the adaptation options uh, for agriculture, for example, uh, adaptation measures can be rehabilitation and restoration of rivers and flood plains, uh, monitoring, modeling and forecasting systems, adaptation of groundwater management, uh, use of adapted crops and varieties, uh, improve the connectivity of ecological networks. For, for health sector, we can have uh, adaptation of drought and water, uh, disaster management for cities, health action plans, green spaces and corridors, water recycling can be adaptation measures for the sector of health. Uh, with this, I would like to, th uh, to thank you all for attending this lecture. Uh, I will stop here and uh, I'm ready to take your uh, questions and uh, to answer these. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yanakopoulos, for the very informative uh, lecture. So uh, let me see if we have any questions. Uh, there is one question already. Uh, before we go to this question, let me you know to give the opportunity to other people also to type their questions. I would like to ask uh, the first question. Many countries, including Greece, have announced that their economies will be carbon neutral by 2050. How realistic is to achieve this goal in the next 30 years when for the last 50 years, the world has reduced the contribution of fossil fuels to this energy consumption from only 10%, from 94% to 84%, namely, 50 years ago, 94% of the energy consumption was from fossil fuels, and uh, currently it has gone down to 84%. So we have not been able to do that much for the last 50 years. How we can cut down the fossil fuels to zero in the next 30 years? How realistic is that? Uh, is this for Greece to cut down the emissions or globally? What is the question about? Well, I, I, it has to be global because okay. otherwise... Uh, because because, because uh, the fossil fuel, of, of course, Greece relies still on fossil fuels, as you know, and uh, yes. we still burn coal. Uh, but Greece is a very, very small country, so the impacts that uh, the emissions of Greece can have uh, from fossil fuels in the global uh, environment for greenhouse gases is very, very small. Uh, so uh, I, I think of, uh, of countries that set uh, the limits uh, to, li to set the target to limit uh, their fossil fuels uh, by 2050 uh, is a realistic target, but the problem is that most other countries are not uh, for example, India and China and other developing countries. Uh, recently, we still also had uh, in, in the previous uh, US uh, presidency, even the US didn't want to achieve any goals for climate change. Now, now of course, the situation for the US has changed, uh, but it has to be taken uh, uh, as a global uh, strategy, that that's why they are this. Uh, is not is not a is not a decision that can be made by some countries. It's good that some countries have decided to limit these emissions, but if 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 the other countries don't don't limit these as well, and they are big players, big emitters, then the target of keeping the global temperature. Uh, below 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, rise is not going to be achieved. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm addressing uh, mainly is the fact that in order to achieve that, you need to have technologies where the energy, uh, it will come from uh, sources like solar and wind and so on. Uh, and it seems that, that since uh, solar and wind are intermittent sources, you need to store and to produce uh, during the time then the wind blows and when light and sun is there, 
and then store it in order to use at the times when there is no uh, sun and uh, the wind uh, does not I know, blow. I know, I know what you mean. You mean, you mean about the technology of the renewables. Exactly, that might, exactly. Might, How uh, the technology is realistic uh, that the technologies they are going to be in now, place. Now, now, now you reach a different different field of science. I'm not. I'm not a, an expert of, on the renewable technologies to tell you exactly if these technologies are uh, close enough to be to be used for that much and to store the energy. I know there have been uh, improvements, but I don't know if they are still in place to to replace completely the fossil fuels. I, 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 I still have my doubts that the, the yeah, but I, I put it in the in the sense that countries they say they're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, and Greece is one of them. Mm -hmm. But then uh, how do they plan to what achieve. kind of energy sources they plan to have by that time? Does Greece have any plans about how its energy is going to be produced by 2050 in order to Cut the, fossil the good, fuels the from... good, the good, the good, the good thing about Greece is that they have Greece has a lot of renewable potential. Uh, th there is a lot of wind power in in the islands of the Aegean. There is also a lot of uh, solar power potential as well due to the high amounts of sunshine. Uh, but I, I, I am still unsure if this can be achieved. Uh, because there, there are also a lot of uh, people that are going to have, uh, for example, uh, uh, wind farms built in their areas uh, are also a little bit uh, pessimistic. They don't want this. So there is a lot of uh, demonstrations uh, happening there. So people, they don't, they don't like to have it. Yeah. So I think it will be difficult in, in my view. To yeah. achieve ca a carbon neutrality by 2050, yes. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, I can elaborate further if there are no other questions, but I will uh, defer it to the other questions now. There is a question here which says Will the combination of a relatively small population and the potential for wind, solar, and geothermal make it possible for Greece? To get to net zero by 2030 or 2040. Hey, it's the same question, I think. This, eh? Um, more or less. Yeah, well, more or less, yes, I suppose. Okay, and then I go to the next one, which says we know that in the United States, for example, there is some social and political resistance, also denial, to addressing climate change. What is the social and political willingness in Greece? On this question, uh, I, I, I think the situation in Greece that uh, politically it uh, it seems to be a lot of willingness uh, to address the issue of climate change. Currently, it seems to be one of the major issues in the in the Greek political system. So. Uh, uh, also, socially, the population uh, seems to be very aware and very, very much fond of addressing the issue of climate change, because most of the population sees the impacts uh, and they experience themselves the impacts of climate change. So they think, or, uh, most of the population thinks, and sometimes it's correct, that the extreme events that happen uh, throughout Greece uh, is an effect of climate change. Either either the high flooding, the flash flooding events that we had like uh, one month ago in October uh, in Athens, or the the big forest fires that we had in Evia this summer, uh, people are very much persuaded that these uh, these impacts of uh, comes from climate change. Also, they see also big changes in their agricultural production. So even, even people uh, that are dealing with ag the agricultural production see that there is a lot of uh, demand for, uh, for this. So uh, I, I think uh, there, is, uh, there is not so much resistance in, in Greece compared to the US to address this. 
and they, I think it is high in the agenda politically, uh, the, 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 the climate change issue. The thing is that I am not sure is that because I showed you in the presentation that there is now a national adaptation strategy so that means to address the impacts of climate change. And there are also regional adaptation plans for the regions of Greece, also even uh, municipal plans in the cities of Greece. Um, so there have, that means there have been detailed studies to target the effects of climate change and they have proposed adaptation measures. The thing that is I'm not sure is whether these adaptation plans and strategies are going to be into effect, into actual effect, because yeah. adaptation strategies, for example, to combat uh, flash flooding events, uh, probably will require a, a lot of public works to take place. Right. I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether this will be finally achieved in the, in the effect of the actual population, but that is the, uh, but but the good thing is that Greece now has plans and strategies uh, that they didn't, they, they had nothing before, okay? Okay, again, another question from Denisios Cavadias. Can you speak to the idea of Medicanes, parenthesis, Mediterranean hurricanes? Is this a new category of phenomena? If so, what will this strike, strike Greece the most? most? Okay. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for this. The Medicaid is a new term, and as you have correctly uh, written there, is a Mediterranean hurricane. Uh, it is uh, it is a very uh, a low, uh, very deep low pressure system that is located uh, somewhere in the Mediterranean, uh, mostly in the central or uh, coming to the East Mediterranean. So Greece can be affected by this. Uh, they have the characteristics of a normal uh, hurricane, uh, but are not uh, as severe as a hurricane that uh, is happening in the tropics. Uh, however, it is a phenomenon that uh, was, not, was unusual, very, very unusual to happen in the Mediterranean in the previous years. So it has become, uh, it has become a, more of a phenomenon in the recent years. Uh, what, what you need to change to take into account is that in the Mediterranean and in Greece, because I showed you that there is a decrease in precipitation. However, there is an, an increase in the extreme precipitation events. This comes from the fact that uh, we are expecting to see uh, fewer weather systems, but deeper weather systems. That means uh, fewer depressions, fewer weather systems that bring bad weather, but these weather systems are going to be more deep, more severe, and some of them are going to reach the the the, the stage of of um, a medicaid. They they will become that strong to be called a medicaid. Uh, yeah. It's not Greece. It's not Greece that is going to be. Uh, okay, affected okay. most. Uh, it's the whole the whole area of the Mediterranean. Yeah. But Greece will be one one of these, uh, especially the western part of Greece uh, and the south part. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Professor Christos Takoudis. What is the usefulness of the presented models when the uncertainty in prediction apparently is from high to very high? Also, the assumptions made each time may critically affect the predictions, don't they? Hey, you, you are right. You, you touched uh, the sensitive issue of, uh, of uncertainty in the model's predictions. Okay, I will tell you that the, the, what I showed you, the, the plots that I showed you come Crump from a variety of climate models. So they, we have used not, not one climate model, but to reduce the uncertainty, we have used uh, all the climate models that existed in the, the, the European databases. This, this, is, a, a, this is something uh, that can reduce the uncertainty. Also, we try to reduce the uncertainty by comparing 
a observed climate. So the climate uh, of, of the observations that we have over Greece with the, what the model shows for the present time period. So we compare the model of the present climate period with observations and see which models fit the observations quite well. These are the models we use in our simulations for the future. And then we use these models uh, to project uh, the future climate. Uh, for the future climate, the uncertainty comes also from the greenhouse gas emission scenarios. That's why I showed you uh, three different kinds of plots when I showed you the with the medium, uh, the optimistic, the pessimistic, and the medium emission scenario of greenhouse gases. Uh, this is also an issue. You don't know what is going to be in the future because you don't know how much countries are going to to emit or not or stop emitting. Okay, so we have an uncertainty coming from the models. We try to reduce this uncertainty by taking as many models as possible, and also taking a, a making a very deep evaluation of models compared with observations from for the present period. And then we use for the future the three different emission scenarios, so three different uh, possible uh, simulations for the future. This is important for people to know that if they do something uh, for the climate, uh, you are going to have uh, fewer impacts. Thank you. Uh, I don't see here any other questions. Stefanos, do you have any other question? The, there are some in the chat that I see. Oh, oh, okay. I don't see them. Can you, Stephanos, please uh, bring them up? Or, or, or I can. Uh, oh, okay. Please go okay. ahead. Uh, yeah. Because it says from Stephanos, what's the difference between the maps on the top tier and those on the bottom tier? Okay, maybe I didn't say that very clearly. The top tier uh, were the maps that were for the near future climate, the climate that is going to be in the 2031 to 2060. And the those in the bottom tier were the the plots uh, for the climate that would be in the end of the century, the changes for the end of the century, 2071 uh, to 2100. Uh, it says, uh, put the websites like Adaptive Grid and GR uh, on the chat. That means the uh, people want to write the web, web addresses uh, somewhere on the chat so that they have them and be able to use them easier, I think. Is it, is it possible or to do it? Uh, I think we can yeah, take let's put it. Let's present. put it, uh, why don't you type it on the chat? Uh, me, it, but now it's very difficult for me to do it because or, I have to go in the presentation to find it. Uh, I, I'll, I'll try to do it, okay, okay. You can send it, you can send it. Uh, or, or, or I can send you these links and you can, uh, you can uh, distribute through your audience. Is it difficult, different, uh, better or, or what is best in the chat? We're going to put it on the website. Okay, okay. Yeah, it will be more easier the way, sort of distributing. Uh, please, especially on the interactive, yes, type your, okay. Uh, then in the, it's a question that we discussed before about the social and political willingness of, of Greece of addressing climate change. And I, I, I don't see others, uh, other questions in the chat. Okay. I want to say, Mr. Homataz, why don't you type your um, email in the chat so that uh, he can send you the link. Anyway, you can keep. Uh, let me, I, I, I have uh, a number of questions. Uh, since there are not any other, let me at least ask uh, one or two of them. Given that uh, the, the critical importance of uh, climate change, which is driven by the use of fossil fuel energy and the very short time window available to arrest the acceleration of the change, should not governments undertake a public information campaign on what is needed to be done for people to reduce the use of fossil fuel consumption, like buying gas, gas their cars, should that be a part of the adaptation strategy? Because here in this country, and I see also in Greece, people, they buy bigger and bigger cars. And some people, you think that they drive trucks to go to their work. 
for they are fascinated by very big cars. And this, of course, they contribute a lot to uh, uh, greenhouse gas production, since the transportation sector is one of the dominant sectors contributing to greenhouse gases. So what do you think when, because you talked about adaptation policy, shouldn't be that a part of the adaptation policy? I think this should be part of, uh, not of a national adaptation policy, but of policy driven to companies. I mean, they, they should in a way enforce this. Uh, they should. Uh, they yes, should... There, are, there are two ways to do it. One is to force the companies. Uh, the other is to make the public not to buy these cars and then buy uh, but if the companies. If... The... If these cars are offered to the public and they are cheaper, right. uh, then the the other thing is just to offer some uh, not incentives for uh, the the opposite of incentives. For example, if you have a car that uh, emits a lot of pollutants, for example, yeah. they they are talking now that you cannot enter com you cannot enter the center of Athens at all if you have a oh, car that good. emits a good. lot. Good, so they, they are talking about this kind of measures, but I'm not sure that these measures will be will be able to be adopted uh, if you are, for example, uh, out of Athens. So, so in Athens, they, they will bring such measures because it's also the air pollution problem. There are so many problems. It, it's huge air, yeah, but they, uh, they, huge they, congestion they, yeah. also because, and this measure is good for the environment, but is also driven by, by other things as well. It's driven by... But because we have huge congestion, they have to do something because we have air pollution on the top of climate change. So they, they, they do this kind of measures and in other cities around the world, and this is also adaptation measure, but also technology needs to bring a cheaper, cheaper cars, a cheaper environmentally friendly cars to the population. I yeah, mean, yeah, because in the United this, States, this, in the United States, uh, you try now to have hybrid cars and uh, make bigger hybrid cars. Uh, well, the hybrid car, it saves something, but the bigger it is, the more it pollutes. Mm -hmm. The governments, of course, they can impose taxes. They can have a taxation. Say, they, can, they can do this, yes. I am, yes, uh, yes. it, it yeah, is a but possibility. What, but what I said in terms of public information is, try to raise the awareness of the people how critical the situation is. Because the more aware the people they are, the, the more willing would be to uh, follow policies which they are going to facilitate facing these uh, very adverse consequences. So I thought that possibly a public campaign uh, where you let people know, because most of the people, they just uh, see a big car, they like it. And the companies also, I know here in the States, they make the argument that uh, when we make small cars, we don't, people, they don't buy them, so you don't make a profit. Most of the profit is made from the big cars. So we make big cars, because that's what the people they want. So that's the argument that the big companies have here in the United States. People, they want big cars and you are going to give them big cars. So if you affect either the wallet of the people by taxation or on the other hand, by raising the awareness. Correct, correct. Bo both both, both, both are possible, possible solutions, yes. They impose, of course, bigger taxes, of course. They make uh, the big cars not so... Uh, not so friendly for, for the consumer anymore yeah, if yeah, you have big yeah. taxes and also yeah. try, try to raise the awareness, yes. The, the raising awareness is a matter that you, you need to do for all sectors, not just... Of course, of course, the... of course, of course. Uh, I don't see any other question either. And then I would try to ask another one of my questions uh, connected to what I said before. If you... Established adaptation strategies, should this be coupled with what really can be done? I mean, in terms of uh, how far we can reduce uh, the release of uh, greenhouse gases, which depends very much of uh, technologies, uh, 
you know, to store, let's say, for in Greece, for example, they have lots of solar and wind, but if you don't store it, and there is no storage technologies, you know, to storage them massively, you are not going to go very far. Because typically, I think uh, you get from the solar, you get about five days, five hours a day, five or six something. Wind, whenever the wind blows or it does not blow. So the rest of the time, it has to be covered from stored energy. Greece does not have uh, uh, capacity to store this they, energy. Yeah, they, exactly. There is not, yeah, there is not the capacity. Not only the Greece does not have the capacity, but Greece or the also, technology. Yeah, Greece does not, is not a country that, of course, they are in universities, they are teams that they do research and development and so on and so on. But most of these solutions may come from countries like the United States, uh, uh, developed countries in um, the European Union, like Germany, France, uh, other countries like Great, Great Britain, uh, the Nordic countries, et cetera, et cetera. So the adaptation strategies, they have to be very much coupled with what really is feasible. By putting, let's say, in Athens, make some wall parks and put some trees here and there, is not going to solve the problem. It's good, but the big problem is going to be solved by cutting drastically the use of fossil fuels. And that's- I think, I think in Greece, no, they, they are trying to cut uh, down the, the fossil fuels from the, uh, from the doing the delignitization, you can say. But I don't think they will cut exactly all the fossil. I mean, if they, we, we, we will keep on taking, uh, for example, natural gas, because uh, there, yes. are, there are pipes of natural gas. So they, I think Greece will start to rely more on these kind of sources. And not, of course, it will not be 100% uh, renewable energy source uh, relying, because it's not, there is no the potential to do it. And there is also, uh, so I think instead of relying uh, on coal, uh, they will rely now on natural gas. Yeah, yeah, but natural gas gives about uh, half the pollution than uh, what, let's say, coal Yes, gas. in this way, in this way, Greece will achieve sometimes. Yes, 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 yes. But in 2050, you know, to be carbon neutral, it means that it will not add any carbon into the atmosphere. So uh, as yes, regards I, seem I, satisfying... I'll tell you how this can be satisfied, because okay. we are not... If we don't have the factories that emit, if we don't have any more the coal factories, and we take natural gas from pipes, we, we don't we don't emit anymore. <laughs> Greece doesn't. No, natural gas is been natural gas. You still produce <laughs> lots of carbon dioxide. Yes. Because natural but... gas it cuts half from the coal. So from now, Greece emits uh, ninety percent. 90% of its energy production comes from uh, fossil fuels, where most of it is oil, and then uh, lignite and so on and so on. Then uh, if it goes to natural gas, from 90%, it would be 45%. Percent. Uh, but 45% is not zero. It's not neutral, yes. I, yeah. I, don't know how, I don't know what they have in mind to do it. Ah, OK, neutral. good, good, uh, good. I, because I, I, had the impression, I had the impression that the no, I'm not... that the National Bank of Greece did uh, has touched these issues too, which they are, uh, I think, are the most critical. Uh, we did well, there will be other experts for uh, energy, ah, no, okay, not me, okay. not me, not me. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, let me see here. See, I see now, uh, please, uh, Gregor Homatas, please post adaptivegreece.gr and other websites. Thank you, Thanas Konomu. The climate change policy will affect the energy demand in Greece in the future. Currently, Greece is going through so-called delignitization, the conversion of to renewable forms of energy. Will this afford this? Will this effort will be sufficient to satisfy the additional demand due to the climate change? How big this demand will be? He wants to say, if I understand well, that if you need more cooling in the future then you will need more energy because Correct. One of, uh, in order to counter the high heat, you need more cooling and then more cooling, more energy and uh, where this energy is going to come from. 
I suppose uh, that's what he wants to say. Yes, and I think there will be some problems because the cooling demand is also concentrated in particular, not just particular periods of the year, also concentrated in particular hours of the day. Sure. So you have huge demands, uh, for example, uh, in afternoon period when it is uh, high heat, also yeah. early early evening or something when people are at home or at work. Yeah. Uh, the, this might mean that energy uh, companies might not be able to meet these demands. So you might end up having uh, some power. Blackouts. Yes, or blackouts. Yes, yeah. uh, it has happened in the past, and uh, unless unless there is uh, some measures taken into account by the companies, uh, they will not be able to solve this because they, you have a lot of demand concentrated in particular periods of the year and particular even particular hours of the day. Yeah, 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 and it's not only with energy. Let me give you an an example of what happened. To me, when I went to Greece this summer, in my house, we did not have water uh, many of the days uh, because the, there was no any heavy rainfall last year, the year before, no snows, and so on and so on. So there were water restrictions, I suppose, yes? Yeah, then, that's right. So there was no water. So it's not only the, the energy, but also water, something very critical. For Greece, water is going to be a very, very critical issue. Correct. The problem is that uh, we project for the future with, that we are going to have a, a less amount of rain. So right. a less amount of rain per year, but also this, this rain that you are going to have is going to be concentrated in shorter periods of time during the year. So that means you are going to have higher precipitation events. Uh, that means, and this water cannot be easily stored because if you have torrential rains or yes, flash yeah. flooding events, the yes. water is not easy to be stored. Uh, so that means uh, you are going to lose even this uh, small water that you are going yeah. to have. So you are going to have to run into problems with water, as you yeah, say. Yeah. Yes. In addition, it's not only it not, it not have water, the one we had water, the water. Now it has become very hard. You could not use it for cooking. Uh, you cannot use it for drinking. So we have to buy yes, water, because, uh, cooking, uh, drinking, and so on. Yeah, because especially if you live by the coast near the seaside, yeah. uh, there has been seawater intrusion in the in the water levels in the water table. So oh, that is going on for many many years. It's not something new. <laughs> That's true. So in Athens, where I am, the water does not come from uh, wells very close to the water. It comes from up the mountains. But okay. uh, it has, the water table has been reduced very drastically. It has become very hard and so on. So the water issue is very, 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 very significant. So I, yeah, I, I think it will be very interesting to have another lecture about the energy and the water. Yes. And the energy, I think, is very critical because everything is driven by the energy needs. Uh, is the production of energy for fossil fuels that has caused the problem. And if this is not solved, nothing else will be solved. I mean, we can have adaptation no. policies, but... And I see another question uh, talk, uh, talking about uh, nuclear energy potential, uh, which... I did not see that. Uh, it's in that... the chat. That person says that uh, they cannot ask it uh, over the Q&A. So they, you have to look into the chat. I don't, I cannot access it. Where is the chat here? It's, it's uh, not actually a question. It says, what about uh, nuclear energy? It says, uh, there well, is well a... Grace, Just, uh, uh, yeah, let, let me say a few about it. I'm a nuclear engineer. So I know the situation about nuclear energy, especially the, the Greeks are very much at the nuclear. So whatever effort in the past uh, had been made for nuclear energy in Greece, uh, the people were very strong against it. But it's, only, it's not only the Greeks, many other people in Europe. The Germans, for example, they had nuclear power and they closed their nuclear power plants. And uh, now they, at the time, they were talking that they are going to cover all the energy demands from 
wind and uh, solar. And now they see that this cannot be done. So they have problems. They bring back uh, coal-fired power plants, which was very hypocritical of them. And also they become more and more dependent on uh, natural gas coming from the Soviet, from uh, Russia. So they become very much uh, dependent on uh, the wheels of Putin, for example, and so on and so on. So yeah, nuclear energy, it was one of the uh, sources that uh, does not have the greenhouse gases, but uh, unfortunately, uh, it contributes some, but not very much into the picture. And uh, I don't think that even if they start to accelerate now the use of nuclear energy uh, in the next, uh, let's say, 40, 50 years, it's not possible to accelerate in a, to a degree that it can offer too much. Although still in the United States, uh, not very much is done about nuclear energy. And nuclear energy is used much more in uh, in China and places like Korea, uh, in France, uh, very heavily, and in some other European countries other than the ones that I mentioned. So nuclear energy has the potential and the technology is there, but unfortunately it did not go the way it should be. And it was fought very much by the environmentalists in the past that many of them now, they support it, but it may be a bit too late. For, the, for, for at least for the next, let's say, 30, 40 years, because you cannot accelerate it. Uh, a technology and which uh, the infrastructure has dismantled, especially here in the United States, in order to come up to full speed in a very short time. So that's in briefly that I 